All right, welcome everyone. Uh, we are here at the From Vectors to Pods Integrating AI with Cloud Native panel discussion. Um, I am Rajesh Kakodkar. I work at Broadcom for all things Kubernetes, and I'm also a tech lead for CNCF Tech Runtime, active in the working group artificial intelligence community. Um, my panelists over here, they need no introduction, but for the sake of completeness, we'll quickly go around and get like a quick intro from everyone. So Ricardo, you want to start? Yeah, I can start. So my name is Ricardo. I'm a, I lead the platforms infrastructure team at CERN, handling everything related to cloud native and machine learning platforms. I'm also in the CNCF technical oversight committee and the end user technical advisory board. I'm Joseph Sandoval. I'm the principal product manager at Adobe for our underlying Kubernetes infrastructure. I'm also a member of the CNCF and user technical advisory board, SIG release manager associate, and also KubeCon co-chair. I'm Kevin Clues. I'm from NVIDIA. I work on the team that enables GPU support in containers and Kubernetes. Uh, one of the main projects I'm pushing right now is uh, DRA, dynamic resource allocation, and I'm also a SIG node maintainer. My name is Dong Chen from Google. Um, uh, I'm one of the original uh, founding engineer for, uh, for the Kubernetes uh, 10 years ago. And also, I'm the one of the tech lead uh, for the signal. And uh, since the inception, the Kubernetes signal founded. And also, I'm the one of the tech lead for the GKE for the last uh, 10 years. All right. Cool. Uh, I think. This KubeCon, uh, similar to last couple of KubeCons, AI has been buzzing around. Uh, someone, someone told me yesterday that ev almost every talk that they went to regarding AI, Q was like something that they couldn't miss out on. Uh, Ricardo had a had an amazing live demo for the keynotes yesterday on multi Q. Uh, so running AI workloads on Kubernetes has been like something. Um, some, something that has proven that cloud native is like the de facto choice of infrastructure. When it comes to these workloads, they've gone from like niche workloads to uh, something that everyone wants to run right now. But in this panel, we're going to flip things around. This discussion is going to be to talk about the other side of things on integrating AI with cloud native. Uh, I don't know how that's going to be. <laughs> we'll just try to pick everyone's brain over here, see how that goes. And just to uh, you know, kick things off. Uh, so quickly, if we can just go around the uh, table, like round everyone, and like quickly get your get your first thoughts or impressions on what are the, some of the areas where you think like cloud native can learn a bit bit or two from AI. So if you can just go through like you know everyone quickly, that would be great. Anyone wants to take yeah. go first. Okay, I'm the new kids here, and uh, I'm also one of the users of the AI and machine learning technology, right? So at least I can share what I see, observed from the Kubernetes and also the uh, other data centers, right? So like Google, how to manage data centers. So AI, that AI machine technology can definitely help us to optimize the resource allocation and the scheduling. And uh, I see all, a lot of all over the cases uh, today, and uh, they can to, to for the reduce of the cost of saving and also AI uh, even in house in the many years I see that AI can help after detect the hardware failure in Google and uh, and resolve of those kind of problems. So maybe I can th th this is the one uh, two two things I'm thinking about. Uh, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, I think the the two things I have on the top of my mind for it are helping with things like automated unit testing. So it's develop unit tests for all of the different areas that aren't covered quite as well as they could be. Uh, as well as things like auto scaling. Um, I always try to separate whenever I'm designing a system, I always try to separate between uh, what's required to build the mechanism to enable something to happen and then the policy that you can build on top of that. I don't really see AI helping, at least not at the in terms of automating the, the building of these lower level mechanisms. They can help the actual engineers to define and you know figure out how to put those uh, those mechanisms together. But where I think AI can really help is in the policies that sit on top of those. And they can pull in AI to help make those policy decisions that they need in order to make use of that mechanism underneath. Yeah, I was going to, I probably second two of the things that both of you mentioned there. But I'm also thinking kind of like uh, some of the design patterns. Um, and we've kind of like 
I think last year, uh, KubeCon Chicago, I think Kevin and I were on a panel and we had one of one other panelist on there. We used bringing like Slurm to Kubernetes and I think the resource management. So all these things I think are really important that uh, will help you know, us from, you know, from that AI, as well as I'm, you know, we were seeing, you know, projects that started organically, um, talking about that placement. Uh, we, we initially saw a project that came up, KGPT, and then we saw that same individual who contributed that project start a new one where it's related to using AI in regards to like, you know, placement and optimization. So I feel like these are like interesting areas to start from, and I think it's a, it's a good place to investigate, and it's going to contribute to uh, uh, some improvements for us. Yeah, okay, so I'll, I'll add something. I think for the research and scientific community, the best thing that AI brought was that we actually got all the primitives that we were asking for for HPC kind of deployments for several years. So all the advanced scheduling, all the requirements we've been uh, trying to pass uh, the message. Actually, AI brought the implementation of all of that. So today, uh, Cloud Native is a very good platform for AI, but it's actually a perfect platform for HPC as well, which is very good. And then there are other areas that are less specific to cloud native, but where things can be quite useful to use AI for. And these are things like anomaly detection in the clusters, in the infrastructure. This is really a, an area that has been explored uh, extensively uh, and can be adapted to cloud native. And then a bit uh, further away, but on the scheduling part, I think given the complexity of the infrastructure uh, for AI, which is using specialized accelerators, uh, different ways to partition uh, the resources, all of this, the scheduling becomes a lot more complicated. Uh, and I would, I think Don mentioned this briefly, but another one that is quite important is uh, cost uh, control. Mm -hmm. um, there are projects uh, that try to train uh, uh, machine learning models to make these decisions uh, on a kind of generic basis uh, for the types of different types of workloads. So this is something that I'm pretty sure it will grow uh, extensively. Yeah. yeah, thank you for that. I, I think uh, there are like three or four kind of themes that I can see in this. One is mostly from a resource scheduling perspective, or okay, we can break that down as well. Like one is from um, optimization of resources perspective, one is a scheduling perspective. Uh, Kevin mentioned things around dev productivity, and I think uh, Joseph, you also kind of uh, brought up kids, GPT and things like that over there. So that's also another theme that's going on, right? So now if we dive into just suppose the scheduling aspect of it, would that, what challenges do you see? Like does that question the way Kubernetes was designed? Like do these changes make us question the preamble of Kubernetes? Does the design get questioned now? Like do we uh, have to rethink about melting things down? Um, like, is that something that comes to mind? Like, when you, when we just talk about the scheduling aspects, I go first. Sure. Um, um, we Kubernetes by design, actually, it is from day one. We want to make that extensible. So we made some of the de uh, design decision and to simplify because we understand the cluster management the orchestration from day one is the, so complicated, right? So the demand at that time, and we don't see the generic AI workload like uh, that lead of the emerging. So there are a lot of decision. I remember in the first KubeCon, uh, the first, the very first KubeCon is just only this big of the room we debate. We have one of the things we decided that it is like for example, maybe it's wrong today we think about it, it is the node, it is uh, uh, cattle, it's not the pet. I think I'm the one to against because I've been in working in the Google internal uh, book system for eight years years before Kubernetes, right? So I uh, obviously as the lead about the uh, uh, data plan and against that, well, how can you treat off the node? It is the cattle and also there's the, a lot of discussing about the nodeness in the future, clusterness. I, I, but to, at the end, I agree with those kind of things because that's simplify for that, especially for the cloud native at that time, right? So majority of the workload is the web or services and it is a stateless, even for the stateful side. Actually, it is reasonable for bringing those kind of things to the uh, cloud, uh, to the to the cloud provider, right? So, so that's the kind of thing. But 
like what I said, from day one, Kubernetes is extensible and it's evolved. It's open to evolvement. So I definitely see the challenge with this uh, um, AI machine learning uh, workload emerging and have high demand, especially for general AI workload because the require of the large way to access of the large uh, data sets and also make sure of the access those throughput, all those efficiencies, all those kind of things. And also all those special hardware expensive and uh, kind of the previous the before what Kevin and Patrick uh, in the in the open source working on the DRA and uh, uh, Kubernetes support those workload right so but uh, it is that we also already have the device plugin um, as the uh, to enable those special hardware but it is really uh, vendor specific which is could make this is the to generate support of the general AI like large training jobs because they require of the large group of the jobs <laughs> autonomic schedule into those large set of the device and the process altogether that it is the challenge right so so this is why we start off the we evolved and start about this device resource uh, assignment to try to standardize uh, structured expose those resources for the special hardware from different vendor uh, in uh, structured parameters and provide a standardized uh, the framework so then you, we can accelerate about of like for example scheduling uh, performance all those kind of things um, there's the many of the other things maybe I just because the Kevin is the really expert here so I leave the current to answer yeah I mean you're, you're mentioning dynamic resource allocation and you know it's not that much different than the device plugin in the sense that some user has to come along and either they request some certain count of, of resources, but now they just have a more expressive way of asking for the types of resources that they want. But I think where AI or other policy decisions can come into this is instead of having the end user create these resource claims or create these resource templates um, to request access to these resources, you can imagine having some higher level controller or something you know, that sits on top of that, that generates these resource claims that then, you know, request the resources behind the scenes. It, it kind of goes back to what I said before about separation of mechanism versus policy. The mechanism is DRA. That's how you express the resources that you want. But then you can build a policy on top of that that figures out how to make use of that mechanism to give you the resources that are required for wherever your workload happens to be. Uh, a concrete example of that is, you know, we've, we've talked a little bit about in other sessions here about this NIM operator that, that NVIDIA recently released. Um, and it provides a high-level CR, CRD to allow you to say, okay, I want to launch this specific uh, NVIDIA microservice um, with this specific optimized model um, that I want to launch. Um, but in that, you don't have to say how many GPUs you want. You don't have to say how much uh, of any resource that you want. And the NIM operator takes care to know, okay, this is what you want. You want it optimized. I know what type of nodes exist in this cluster, so I'm going to generate a resource claim template on the fly put the number of resources that I know it needs to have to run optimized, and then it'll go off and launch it in the cluster for you. Yeah, so, so we kind of see like uh, operators getting smart in, in a certain way uh, on this regard. And Kevin, I, I think almost everyone over here wants to ask you like when DRA is going to get GA or something, but I'll ask you a different question. Uh, on the similar lines of this, uh, do you see use of any of these deep learning models or ML models to write Kubernetes configurations in itself. So we briefly talked about scheduling <coughs> challenges that Don mentioned about like how Kubernetes is extensible. You also talked about the NIMA operator and things like that, but like taking this um, forward, like generating configurations kind of, um, so we also had s certain aspects of anomaly deduction and things like that, right? So on those similar lines, can we make uh, our Kubernetes operations uh, smart. Is that to me? Um, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, we can go around to the other panelists. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say. I don't. I mean, anything's possible, right? Um, <laughs> I myself, like I, I have mentioned this a few times, this whole separation of mechanism from policy. I'm more of a mechanism person. I enjoy building that low-level infrastructure that people can then design really complex usage use use cases for. Um, and so I think that question is better suited for someone that actually designs these policies that make use of those mechanisms. I'm just not that person. Maybe I, I, I can add something we are trying to do internally, and it's again back to efficiency, which is to reduce our carbon footprint internally. 
And things we do is launch the workloads and then tune the parameters in the boxes and measure the actual uh, benchmarks fr from the application live. So we have some metrics that tell us how efficient the applications are. Then we start lowering the power uh, or the CPU clock or something like that and just measure how that affects the, the, the actual workload. So it's not necessarily on the configuration of the clusters, but it is in the configuration of the infrastructure to kind of maximize the power consumption and still achieve whatever we need uh, or we've set as, as required metrics. Got it. Yeah, I think uh, that's a very interesting area for sure. Like, you know, power metrics is one thing and we also mentioned cost and things like that. So all of these things can be optimized. But shifting gears, um, Joseph, I'd, I'd like to bring you in the discussion over here. Uh, we see uh, challenges around scheduling AI workloads um, in a lot of um, end user companies as well on how they're trying to um, get all of these things running in. But are there, is the appetite for end user companies to involve ML algorithms or the uh, deep learning algorithms to optimize the scheduling aspects? Or is there some work happening in that front? Yeah, so yeah, it feels like there's kind of two questions here. Um, and I'll probably start with the first part of it. I think a lot of us like, initially had challenges, obviously, because over the last year, so much has, has changed um, that allows us to be able to run things efficient, efficiently. Availability is, is is a thing, you know, and how you know, go about this. I think yesterday we had a keynote with CoreWeave, and they were kind of demonstrating at scale like some of the challenges that they have and how important it is for them to catch these things when they do fail because there's you know a cost component to these things, and you know they want to be able to do this in a way that you know when they when things do get scheduled that you know you you go to whatever's available or the right region. What's, and so I think that I still think is gonna it, it's evolving. From an end user perspective, I think one of the things I'm seeing a lot from the you know advisory board, and I know Ricardo is in this as well, is just even like we're you know we're, we're moving fast, but you also see that there's a lot of you know so certain companies that are leading, but that there's still a lot of individuals still struggling to try to understand like how do I run these things efficiently? Um, I think you know go back to something Kevin did last uh, in Paris, and he kind of gave a roadmap of how, here here's how you can kind of get started. And we probably still need to work with our end users to help them to get more efficient and running workloads and the type of workload specifically too, you know, whether it's, you know, AI or ML type things. And the one interesting thing though is I was recently at a conference in San Francisco and it's, it's very interesting because here we are at this, you know, we're all in this cloud native kind of thing. San Francisco, you're seeing there's this whole other, and a lot of other cities are seeing this, you know, generative AI collectives, all these other communities. But there's a lot of interesting, like, especially in the MLOps community, like a lot of the things that we, uh, how we learn to run our systems, like there's some, there's some commonalities there. Um, I think we can learn from each other to be able to kind of find ways to start to introduce these things. But then I also think of like safety and systems as well. Like we have to really be cognizant, like, uh, you know, of the things we want to introduce and, and where, are, where are the right inputs that we should be interfacing at. Yeah, and I, I think uh, at, at this point, maybe we, sh we can talk about the challenges of these as, as well. Like we talked about extensing, ex extending Kubernetes. We're talking about like how end user companies should um, get all of these techniques to like optimize their workloads and things like that. But what are the challenges around the data ethic ethics out of it? Like what are the challenges of um, pipeline or model attestation, sub software supply chain aspects and things like that. Like, do you see any of those as well? Like risks of using AI in cloud native is where I'm alluding to. I'll, I'll jump in. So from from our perspective, one of the risks is, uh, is actually the cost. Um, if we, right now we, we are at maybe not the peak, but at the hype uh, of the cycle. So people are willing to pay a lot for these resources and to, to experiment with them and see what can be done. But one, one of the challenges we will have very soon is that when these things become more commodity, people will start planning long-term investments. And this is where you have to balance really if this is the right tool for the job on a cost perspective to achieve better or the same efficiency. So this is something we started looking at internally to very clearly have these benchmarks that will tell us, uh, yeah, we, we can achieve a lot more uh, with the, this or that technology, but it's, is it really worth it long term when we start planning to buy hardware for the next five years or 10 years? I think one thing I can add to the, the distinction between, you know, like running a full training job for many, many days, many months versus 
people just experimenting a little bit and making you you know small modifications to their model on a subset of the GPUs that are available. And this is where something like GPU sharing and especially the stuff that DRA is helping to enable yeah. comes into play because you don't need access to a, an entire cluster of GPUs. You can probably use even a fraction of just one GPU on one machine to get your model going. Um, and actually I have a talk later today called um, which GPU sharing strategy is right for you, um, which kind of walks through the trade-offs on using one sharing strategy versus another and what use cases each of those um, ties into. So if you're interested more in how you can make use of these GPUs for, you know, mostly for cost-effective reasons, um, I encourage you to come to that talk. I think it's at 4.30 this afternoon. I can add a little bit, sure. and I agree with the, both the Ricardo and the Kevin, but uh, on the other side from the usability side, and uh, uh, I think Kubernetes today, because on t there's a lot of the workflow for AI machine learning workflow built on top of the Kubernetes, but it is not integrated very well, so there are a lot of ongoing effort. The one of those challenges it is because for data scientists, uh, it's different from the previous software engineer, right? Department their workload of services on top of cluster. And uh, their scientists actually have the unique of the uh, skill sets, but they are not familiar with uh, software deployment, services deployment. And especially for those AI machine learning uh, uh, work, and they they have tons of the experimentation and they have to try. So how to quickly, easily access uh, to the uh, to, uh, um, minimum of the resource and then they can scale up to push it to the uh, to the cluster and then can quickly turn around and uh, and the toning all those kind of things actually I as the Kubernetes developer from day one, um, I feel I don't understand those whole flow, and there's the many things I try to learn here, and uh, then we can build the help to understand the requirement. This is the challenge part, so which require of the weak collaboration and require about our uh, like the data scientists and all those expertise send 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 those requirement uh, to us, so we can build all those. Things. Another thing is found the cost efficiency. There's tons of things, and uh, since Kevin's here, I, I finally he's uh, sit next to me today because I know he's too busy. And uh, to make this, uh, we really need of uh, looking for more dynamic resource allocation and more efficiency. And uh, Kevin just mentioned a fraction of GPU sharing, and uh, and also what about the hard plug? of the GPU and the kind of dy dynamic of the, uh, not like the physically attached about that to the node, in standard dynamic on demand, we can attach off the GPU to the node and uh, also dynamic detach when the job is finished. All those kind of things can give us like the infrastructure people more flexibility and also what's the building in about isolation. Anyway, there are tons of the long list in my mind that we can push it forward as the in infrastructure people and work together to make that is more cost efficiency and then we can build a more advanced scheduling algorithm. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I think another aspect, like just to bring the community aspect of it also in the picture, Ricardo, you are in the TOC as well as uh, with the end user tab. Uh, Joseph, you sit on the end is user tab. Don, Kevin, y'all are maintainers of Kubernetes in one aspect or the other. Uh, at this point, what innovative projects would you see coming come up in the cloud native ecosystem, particularly from these themes around <laughs> scheduling opportunities, resource optimization, um, cost optimization, helping uh, scheduling of AI workloads in a in a in an, in an innovative way, helping just AI workloads run on cloud native infrastructure in an innovative way. So what sort of projects do you want to see come up in this ecosystem? Um, I can just I can go next, but it's just to throw one out there. One of the main things that we see people complaining quite often about is um, detecting and remediating uh, failures of GPUs and full nodes in the cluster. And so I think I've seen at least three to four talks here at KubeCon about this exact topic. Um, and there's no standardized way to deal with this. And so I think we need to kind of rally around and figure out the right way to do this and potentially even provide it as a component that's shipped with our GPU operators so that everyone has it available to them. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably I'll go a little bit different direction because, you know, we have two of the most smartest people I know here sitting next to me when it comes to the underlying. But 
more of a like as a consumer of like a lot of the cloud native products and i think of areas like you know uh you know telemetry and, and these areas where as you scale up there's a lot of challenges there i feel like there's also this is probably outside of ai maybe this will help improve this area um but i still feel like we're kind of going to go through a little bit of a reset in a sense of how we should be instrumenting it early you're going to get a lot of signal help me find those things that are going to diagnose when i'm having problem in my my infrastructure i feel like right now a lot of us have to do a lot of heavy lifting on platform teams to deal with these things and cloud native community has been great we have a lot of great projects in here but i think i'm my hope is that we start to find smart ways to do this so that we can you know optimize our our roles as like platform engineers infrastructure engineers yeah, I'll, I'll just add to that um, uh, more on the ops uh, part and the integration. So we've seen quite a few products coming or projects coming with, for MLOps, what people are usually calling MLOps, to support users through their life cycle of going from experimentation to actually serving models efficiently in production. This is not obvious at all. Uh, there are some uh, solutions around. But I think uh, one of the main goals of our community should be to define the best practices and the architectures mm -hmm. that will help everyone uh, have an easier path to, to getting things in production. It, it, it does require a lot of work and a lot of knowledge still today. So uh, reference architectures, <coughs> some sort of uh, telemetry, and then detecting issues with GPUs, like some of the themes that I see over here. And I completely agree with this. Like, in a way, when we have a platform that's running such complex workloads, there should be a top-down approach to see what's happening over here, what can be the potential threats or issues that may come up, and how can we detect them like early on and then try to fix them. Probably with suggestions on how to fix them as well. Um, all right, cool. I think we can leave like five minutes for Q&A, so, so this can be like, my last question over here, uh, which is um, we, we've had like a, a decade of Kubernetes cloud native, which was, and I feel that that belonged to the maintainers. As we step into this next decade, I think it's going to be the end users as well as the maintainers going forward and taking this ecosystem forward. At this juncture, so two questions. <laughs> what are the problems, or what is one complex problem do you see for this next decade? And the other one is, how do you convince A, your employer, that this is an important problem that's going to face, that's, that we're going to face uh, in the next decade? And how do you keep the community uh, motivated for this? So uh, let me repeat, like, what, what is like the one complex problem that you see? And then I'll go back to the second question after that. Um. <laughs> I'm from Google. I think I don't have the trouble to convince my leadership on AI and machine learning related stuff. Um, but uh, as a human, I'm more concerned about the humanity related issue. Um, I I work on the this one. I support the advanced AI machine learning technology. But uh, often I ask myself, am I doing something right? For, for human uh, being, and uh, I, I do ask this. One of the things I convince myself, it is just, okay, nobody can stop this moving forward, and you better jump into, and you try to make that is the better, instead of become too worse. So that's the only things I kind of, the, often I ask myself, what are you doing, what are you doing? Is the possible like the heart uh, next generations? And I have, if I, I don't have kids, then maybe I worry less, less, less. I have kids, so I worry more because I, I could be ben benefit from this, all those kind of new technology booming, all those kind of things. But what's about to the next generation? That's, that's the challenge I have the most. The technology challenge I think we can work on yeah. and address. This is the top one. So, so social challenges yes. rather than technical yes. challenges. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Well, I think I can echo that, and I think that's that's a good answer. And I think I'll leave it at that for for the answer to the first question. But I think I can answer the second question at least from Nvidia's perspective. You know, we're we're dedicated to you know making it as easy as possible. You know, we're, you know GPUs are a critical piece of the infrastructure for um, all AI related stuff at least today, um, and we're dedicated to making sure that. You know, we help enable the community to build the software that's required to make it as easy as possible to make use of 
you know, the different variants of hardware they're going to be coming out over time. So um, I don't see that as a challenge so much as an opportunity <laughs> um, because we're there and we're, we're ready to help, you know, make this, make this happen. So. Yeah, I think I need you to give me some GPUs in certain regions that I sometimes struggle with. So if you can help me there, I think we're good. Um, I, I, I want to I wanna chime in on something because my, my co-chair Nikita is sitting here and she touched on something today about security. I, I think about this a lot and I, this is why I thought it was really important that we finished with um, two individuals who are working in tag security. This problem is only going to get more difficult. I don't know what it's going to look like, but we know this landscape is going to change. I think what this means for us as a community is we need to, as they put that call to action at the end, is that we all need to lean in on all our projects and really with that mind and keeping these things. And as these things advance, I think that's going to be, for me, one of the challenges. All right. And I'll, I'll add what I see is the main challenge for the scientific community. Traditionally, we've been um, having bigger challenges as time passes, but we were trusting uh, the existing tech to progress in the same way. So we, we didn't really have a big paradigm shift, shift for the last 20 years or so. This is what's happening now. Um, a lot of the workloads need to shift to become ML enabled, uh, very different ways of uh, developing uh, the codes and the platforms. And also the access to the technology, we see a lot more heterogeneous kind of uh, um, uh, hardware available. It's no longer the couple of CPU architecture we are used to and we need to adapt. And this, this is a big transition and it's really a paradigm shift that will happen in the next few years. It's interesting, it, it reminds me of in 2008, 2009 when they stopped increasing the yeah. clock frequency of a single CPU and you started to see a lot more yeah, exactly. CPUs on the die and now this is happening at the next level. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, so before we open it uh, to the audience for questions, it's uh, been a pleasure talking to all of you folks. Like, thank you for joining this panel discussion. I think a couple of takeaways that have come up from this is that if you're trying to integrate AI with cloud native, you should focus on cost optimization, issues with uh, GPU monitoring, open telemetry, anomaly detection, making your operators smart and extends, extending Kubernetes. So I think we should really think of that while keeping, like what Don mentioned was like really important while keeping the humanity aspect of it uh, in cognizance as well. So thank you everyone. Uh, I, I think we can take a couple of questions. We've got five minutes. Hi, uh, thanks for uh, all your experiences. I'm a, a cloud architect for an enterprise. We are in the verge of getting into, uh, you know, hosting our own generative AI applications by hosting models and stuff. I've been running Kubernetes for uh, for many years. The concept of Kubernetes were a pod as a self-contained unit where we could scale by adding more pods, more replicas. And if one pod goes down, I can have three replicas so that it gives the resiliency and stuff. But great so far. But the moment we start looking at large language models where a model has to spawn across multiple nodes or multiple pods, uh, the concept of resiliency and scalability becomes uh, a bit challenging. Mm -hmm. And often there are other uh, solutions like Ray, which can do the scheduling and stuff. But then the challenge is now I have to understand another orchestration layer to understand how that works with uh, <laughs> Kubernetes as an orchestration layer. Mm -hmm. I know there's work having, uh, happening around DRA and stuff, which could help us isolate that. But how do you see, how do you handle these problems today? And how do you see this is you know, going to be addressed in the future? Maybe I go first. Um, uh, thanks for that. Uh, actually, we are proactively looking to those kind of things. And uh, so one of those, like you talk about the multiple host of the, uh, 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 to support of the model, right? So this is actually, we are looking into those kind of things. And uh, and also part of the DIA actually the also try to address one of those goals to address the, those kind of problem. And you talk about the RE, and uh, we also community actually partner with the RE community. And we have the several proposal and how to uh, there's the cube array and you try to use in the CRD of the Kubernetes and to, to represent of the re task and re services and also re cluster in the Kubernetes privately way and actually in, I also have the proposal even simplified the re integration and the more build a lot of technology latently for the on top of the Kubernetes so that proposal actually shared uh, 
uh, shared with the Kubernetes community is kind of under discussing. So how we are going to enable more efficient of the uh, scheduling for real lack of the batch workload scheduling and also how to integrate with the DRA and all the rest of the environment. And there's the, many of the things is ongoing discussing other things, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, from, I agree with everything you said. The, the one thing I think I would add, at least in relation to DRA, is that it's, it's designed to kind of help abstract some of, this, some of the complexity of this away so that, you know, you can make a reference to a type of resource that you want, whether that's um, something uh, that we've designed and built recently for multi-node and V-links. We can use DRA to set up uh, something called an IMEX channel and you make a request for one of these IMEX channels, and as long as you have access to that and you pass that to all of your different pods, they now have the ability to make use of um, uh, multi-node and VLink without the user having to understand the complexity of what's going on behind the scenes. And so um, I can see this helping out with, with some of these problems that you're seeing because you know it doesn't just make sure that you have access to this resource, it also makes sure that you get scheduled onto the nodes that provide this resource. And the end user doesn't have to think about the, the details of setting up pod affinities or any of this other stuff behind the scenes to make that happen. Yeah, thanks. And I have a suggestion or a feedback. Uh, there are software defined layers now available which abstract the complexity of PVCs by the, having their dedicated parts or nodes which handle. It. Could there be something like that for GPUs where GPU devices is available for the parts? And I could determine, you know, I want to scale the parts multiple times without having to attach the pod directly or the GPU devices directly to the pod. Today, I think the complexity comes because the GPU is you know, attached to the pod and I have to determine how to do the orchestration yeah. of this whole piece. Too. I mean, I think the answer is no for now <laughs> <laughs> because these are really node local resources. I think things like TPUs are different. Oh. TPUs can be attached um, over the network. They don't have to necessarily be a node local device. But at least for NVIDIA GPUs, because they're node local, it's, I don't really see that being possible, at least not anytime soon. This is why I earlier asked yeah. a hard plugin <laughs> to, to a earlier. Cool. Thank you.